Welcome to the Subrogation, Additional Insured, and Other Messy Insurance Matters webinar. My name is Richard, and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Mr. Jeff Coleman. You may begin. Well, greetings. This is Jeff Coleman. I'm sitting in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, now, Richard, have you turned over the controls to me yet on the uh, – there we go. All right. We're sitting in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where our high Monday was about 26 degrees. I don't think I'm probably getting any sympathy from those of you on the East Coast. Uh, the topic today is subrogation additional insured and other messy insurance matters. My understanding is this uh, was prompted by some concerns over subrogation and – uh, requests for subrogation that were being forced on concrete contractors uh, in some of these contracts that are coming, I assume, from general contractors. As an initial matter, I want to make sure you collect questions because I, I can almost guarantee that my portion of the presentation is not going to take the full time. We'll have a lot of time for questions and answers. This, by far and away, is going to be the cheapest time you will ever spend with a lawyer. So if you have questions, you should make sure you get them in uh, at the end or submit it. Uh, this is a timely topic. I uh, never set out to know anything about general liability insurance, and yet uh, there is an element or an aspect of every, uh, in every single case that I handle of either general liability coverage or additional insured status uh, usually waiver of subrogation doesn't come up that often, but it sometimes does. Uh, but it's usually either coverage or additional insured status, and those are the issues that we're seeing. Now, the other reason it's timely uh, is because there are changes coming on the ISO forms, and we'll talk about a couple of those in a minute. ISO is a, an organization that drafts standard general liability policies for the various parties in the who, who issue these GL policies. Those then have to be adapted by those carriers and approved by the states typically in which they're in. So it doesn't happen real fast, but there are some changes coming and those are being driven in part, and we'll discuss this in a minute, uh, by changes in legislation and statutes regarding indemnification uh, and insurance coverage. The other reason it's timely is that there's a real battle line being drawn right now between general contractors and subcontractors over indemnification and in particular defense. Uh, there is an emerging trend in the United States starting in California and Massachusetts to try to define the defense obligation in an indemnification clause as an independent duty. So we're seeing cases like the CH2M Hill case in California where you end up having to defend even though you might be 0% at fault because defend is seen as an independent duty. So we want to keep an eye on that. Um, and then that's being counteracted in part by some uh, legislatures with anti-indemnification -indemnif statutes. But that is, when you look at emerging trends, that's what's coming down the pipe. Now, one of the things I get to do, I guess, as a presenter is, is shameless self-promotion. So. Uh, this is our firm uh, in the Twin Cities area. We actually have seven lawyers. I show this picture just so that I can show people that uh, only the name is solo, not the firm. Uh, and we do focus our practice on the concrete construction industry and are active in, in ASCC, as, as many of you know. Uh, by way of pedigree, um, my uh, bachelor's degree was in civil engineering and a master's in structural in 76 and 77. I'm still a PE in Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, an attorney in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and now North Dakota, uh, fellow in the American Concrete Institute, ACI National Board of Directors currently. MCC is the Minnesota Concrete Council president, and I have a book out on legal issues in concrete construction. So the way I teed this up is uh, I, I sat down for a minute and I said, okay, if I'm a, if I'm a concrete contractor and I've got 60 minutes today, what do I need to know about my insurance? What do I need to know about this GL policy that I've got in place? Well, rule number one is that you want to hire the best insurance broker you can find who specializes in coverage for contractors. 
that's generally not going to be uh, the agent that you have for your homeowner's insurance or the agent that you have for your auto insurance or even the agent that you maybe have for your other equipment uh, coverages. Uh, this, this GL policy, uh, how it operates in a, in a construction context and the various uh, rules regarding additional insurance, the your work exclusion, uh, and the different types of policies that are available that vary between carriers uh, is very, very uh, detailed and specific and uh, not simple run-of-the-mill uh, insurance coverage. So you'll want to find an insurance broker that specializes in this stuff. Now, rule number two is sit down with your broker and go over the policy option for the things that we're going to cover today. First of all, the GL policy and, and what is covered, and then the biggest uh, issue that is, in fact, not covered. Uh, many people don't realize that your work, absent any other damage to property or persons, your, just simply your work is not covered under the GL policy. And I'll talk about and explain why that is uh, and what you need to watch for there. Then we're going to talk about who is covered. And we're going to talk about additional insureds. And if I were able to have you raise your hands and I could see them, I'm guessing that every single one of you is being asked to provide additional insured status to the general contractors and or the owners that you work for. Then we're going to talk about what your duties are if there's a claim, what, you're, what you have to do and what you have to be careful not to do. Then we're going to talk about subrogation, which I understand has come up recently as a hot topic uh, what is it, how has it been used in the past, uh, and how is it currently being abused or overused currently? And, and, and then I, I may want to get try to get some feedback from you on what you're seeing out there and what's driving this, this interest, current interest in, in subrogation. So some people do know more about risk than we do. You, you, uh, I don't have to preach to the choir here and tell you that you're in a risky business. Uh, you think of the amount of materials and manpower that have to come together and everything has to work properly and you have to end up with uh, uh, proper concrete properly placed and properly consolidated and properly cured and properly finished and then hope that it doesn't crack. Uh, and by the way, if you want information on cracking, I've got two articles in Concrete International in September and this month that covers my other seminar I've done on when is concrete cracking a defect. But we know that we're dealing in a risky business for, uh, at the end of the day, not a lot of money, and one little glitch can cost us our profit on the job. We also know that we can cause damage to property, we can cause damage to people, and that's why we have this GL insurance policy. So the basic form that you have uh, is, a, is a GL policy form. It's, uh, it's multi pages, it's about 16, 17 pages. But the other part you have to look at carefully is that there are, in some cases, the one I'm holding in front of me, 45 endorsements, all types of state-specific endorsements, uh, uh, flood insurance notices, schedule of premises, nuclear energy liability exclusions, uh, commercial general liability uh, exclusions, uh, exclu exclusion of certified acts of terrorism, uh, and on and on and on. And unfortunately, you have to be, or you need a broker at least, who's reasonably aware of those exclusions, reasonably aware of which of those exclusions might be able to be negotiated in or out of your contract, of your insurance policy, uh, and, and you need somebody who's on top of those options. And the other thing I want to point out, uh, because I mentioned it and I glossed over it, uh, and, and it's obvious to lawyers, but it's not necessarily so obvious to everybody else, the insurance policy is simply a contract. It, it's a contract that says that the insurance company will pay for certain things if certain things happen, and then a whole bunch of things are excluded. Uh, I sat down with a broker, not actually an underwriter once in London, and after about two or three bottles of wine, that underwriter looked across the table at me and said, Jeff, you, it, it's not that difficult. Uh, the way insurance works is that I get you to give me as much money as I can get, 
and then I try to hold on to it as long as I possibly can. That's basically how insurance works. In, uh, now, I'm sure the people from CNA Insurance are about ready to strangle me, but that's, uh, that was from an underwriter in London. All right, so what is covered? Uh, there is a very simple uh, one-paragraph insuring agreement at the start of your policy. It says that we will pay those sums that the insured becomes legally obligated to pay as damages because of bodily injury or property damage to which this insurance applies. And we will have the right, but more importantly the duty, to defend the insured against any suit seeking those damages. So if we break this down, and this is the essence of your insurance policy in this one paragraph, so we will, pay, we will pay sums that you become legally obligated to pay, meaning uh, in, a, in a lawsuit or an arbitration or by operation of, a, of, of some other legal activity. And they have to be paid as damages. They have to result from bodily injury or property damage to which the insurance applies. And that's a really important phase because what we're going to find next is while there's one page of insurance coverage, there's about four pages of exclusions, which we have to be carefully, carefully review. And then we'll have the right and the duty to defend. Now, the duty to defend, I'm going to talk about in a bit. Uh, and they also have the right to defend, which means typically they have the right to select and or at least approve counsel. You should know that the larger you are and the more bargaining capacity you have, uh, you have the right to uh, at least talk to the carrier about appointment of counsel and who will handle the case for you uh, on the uh, depending on the carrier depending on the size of the insured uh, sometimes the insured can designate in advance who's going to defend cases as long as those uh, lawyers are uh, adequate and approved by uh, the insurance company so that varies across the map again it's something you should talk to your broker about All right, another point is that the duty to defend is broader than the duty to indemnify. Well, what the heck does that mean? Uh, basically, that means that any time your insurance carrier under this GL policy has something that triggers any possible coverage under the policy, they then have a duty to defend that case. So even if there is one allegation or count in a lawsuit that requires a defense, the carrier must defend the entire case. Now, that might mean that they will send you what's called a reservation of rights letter. It's a letter that says, well, we'll take on the defense, but there may be no coverage because of all these different reasons. And you may, in fact, get to the point in the case where the carrier could pull the trigger on a, on a denial of coverage if they decide that they've learned enough that the coverage doesn't apply. It doesn't happen real often. Uh, more often than not, what I've seen is that a carrier will look at the case and say, this just, this just arises out of damage to your work, therefore there's no coverage. Uh, but when that happens, you should at least consult with your broker, and they may advise that you consult with a coverage attorney. And at low, low be it me to, to, to advise that you talk to yet again another attorney, but there are attorneys who specialize in sorting out whether something's covered under these policies or not, and before you give up on coverage, you should consult with one of them just to make sure that there is or is not coverage or there might be uh, an appropriate point at which you might want to bring what's called a declaratory judgment action to try to establish coverage. Think of it as another job site. This is a slide I show to my uh, clients when I give presentations to them or when I talk to groups. Some of you in this group I know have already seen this slide before in my other presentations. But this is, this is the place where you don't want to be. You would rather be out on the job pouring concrete, making money, and uh, earning uh, overhead and profit on jobs because you don't get any of that in this venue. Uh, even though your carrier might end up paying for it, and even though you might have no deductible in your policy, meaning they defend from dollar one, you still end up losing a lot of time and a lot of money uh, sitting in this venue. All right, as I mentioned before, there's one page of insuring agreement, and there's four pages of exclusions. Well, 
what are the exclusions? There's uh, an expected or intended injury. If you do something that's expected or intended to cause damage or injury, that's not covered. Uh, there's contractual liability, but then that gets expanded later. There's liquor liability that would be covered by another policy if you want coverage for that. There's workers' comp for which you have other coverage. There's employers' liability for which you have other coverage. Pollution liability is excluded, uh, but you can get other coverage for that. Aircraft, auto, or watercraft is excluded, but you can get other coverage for that. Mobile equipment is excluded, but you can get other coverage for that. War is excluded. I'm not aware of any carrier who will cover you for acts of war. Uh, they, they don't want to write insurance where uh, everything is expected or intended to destroy everything. Uh, damage to property uh, that you uh, own or rent yourself, that's not covered because you get other property coverage for that. Damage to your products is not covered. Damage to your work, I'm going to set aside for a minute because we're going to talk about that uh, in some detail. And then damage to uh, impaired property or property not physically injured, again, it's basically your product or your work uh, that's not covered. Recall of products is not covered, but then you can get product liability coverage for that. Uh, personal and advertising injury, again, there's other coverage for that. Electronic data. So the loss or use of electronic data is not covered, but I believe you can get other coverage for that. Distribution of material in violation of statutes is not covered. Uh, and I'm not sure you can get coverage for that. But that's an example of the various things that are not covered. And again, an example of why you want to have a broker who understands all these various coverages and makes sure that all the various parts of your operation uh, and your equipment, your mobile equipment, your trucks, everything else, is in fact covered. Over the top of all that, you then might have a umbrella policy, an excess umbrella policy that would extend the limits of those coverages. So that's another uh, area that you'd want to that you want to look at. All right, the key, the primary exclusion I want to talk about here is the what's called the your work exclusion. This is the one that comes up the most often when we're talking about the GL policy. And this is basically what it says. This insurance does not apply to damage to your work. Property damage to your work arising out of it or any part of it and included in the product's completed operations hazard, which basically means completed work. Uh, and then there's an additional paragraph in some of these policies that says this exclusion does not apply if the damaged work was performed on your behalf by a subcontractor. So that means that if you have a subcontractor that performs work, then damage to your work will be covered. That's an exclusion to the exclusion, which, again, is why this stuff gets so complicated. Not only are there exclusions, but there's exclusions to the exclusions, which are good things. The exclusions are bad things. So the bottom line is, if, if, if you pour concrete uh, and it cracks, that's generally not covered. If you pour concrete and it cracks and that allows water to get into a building and causes damage, mold, and other things, that generally would be covered because that's damage to property other than the work itself. If that work was performed by a subcontractor to you, then that work would be covered. But you have to be careful because there's a lot of policies out there, or at least some, that don't include that uh, subcontractor exclusion to the your work exclusion. So one of the things you want to ask your broker is, what does my uh, your work exclusion say? And does it include this subcontractor uh, provision? Now, I'm not sure how many of you actually have subcontractors performing work for you, but if you do, this then becomes significant. All right. Now, the keys here are the occurrence must cause damage to property other than the work itself. And the most important point is that the claim or suit must allege damage to property other than the work itself. The reason I say that is because rule number three, whether there is damage to property other than the work itself is generally judged by the allegations in the complaint or the lawsuit and not by what the carrier may think. What does that mean? That means that if you get sued and there are allegations about damage to property other than the work, that should trigger coverage under your policy, even with the your work exclusion. 
So you want to be careful uh, that you evaluate what's alleged, and that's how the coverage gets judged, not necessarily by what uh, the carrier may have uh, uh, investigated or, or come up with. All right, rule number four. You do want the policy form with the subcontractor exclusion to the your work exclusion, and that's because uh, you want to have the broadest coverage possible, and you want to have coverage for your work to the extent you can if it's done by a sub. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and see how this works. Uh, but Richard, if you're there, I want to ask if there's any questions about the, uh, the your work exclusion. Can we do that? Yes, thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press zero, then one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press zero, then two. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if there are any questions, please press zero, then one on your touchtone phone. Standing by for audio questions. And if there aren't, we'll keep moving, but I just want to pause for a moment. Again, that's zero, then one on your touchtone phone. All right. If there's no questions, I'm going to keep moving. I think I'll, I think I'll keep moving. All right. Pardon me. We do have a question online from Kathy Reynolds. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the uh, recommendation is to get an experienced agent or broker I have many that call me claiming they're experienced. I don't know how to determine if, in fact, they are. Well, that's a good question. I would uh, try to get some references. Uh, a good experienced broker is going to be somebody who's working for a lot of other contractors. And I would, rather than picking your broker uh, that way, I think I would go to either the industry groups in your area or other contractors that you know, or other resources that you know, and ask who the good brokers are that are out there working with contractors and subcontractors. Thank you. All right, I'm going to keep moving. Thank you, Richard. All right, you're now, welcome. Next question is who is covered? All right, obviously you're covered because you're paying for the policy, but there are two other vehicles by which other people can be covered under your policy. Uh, and, and I mean what I just said. They are covered under your policy just as if uh, they are you. And that's why I want to be so careful about granting somebody else what's called additional insured status on your policy. So B is anyone listed on an additional insured schedule, and that's an actual idea actually a document in the policy, it's an endorsement, and it has a list of who's an additional insured. Now, typically that was the only way you could be an additional insured on the policy, uh, and then you had all kinds of issues come up where uh, somebody was promised that they would be an additional insured on a certificate of insurance, and a certificate of insurance is not part of the policy. It's supposed to be evidence of the coverage, and it may create some broker liability if it's incorrect, but the certificate of insurance is not part of the policy. So you have these situations where your client asks to be an additional insured, you get a certificate with them named as an additional insured, but then they don't actually get added to an endorsement on the policy. Well, there are a number of lawsuits that arose out of that, and they still occur. Uh, so in part, in part because of that, and in part to make it easier for you to operate, the carriers and the ISO added what's called a blanket additional insured endorsement. So what the heck is that? Well, here's an example of one. And this blanket endorsement is endorsed to your policy, so you have to make sure you have it so it works this way. But then the insured is amended to include as an insured any person or organization for whom you are performing operations when you and such person or organization have agreed in writing in a contract or agreement that such person be added as an additional insured on your policy. Such person or organization is an additional insured only with respect to liability arising out of your ongoing operations performed for that insured, 
Now, that, question, that opens the question whether it includes completed operations. And a person's or organization's status as an insured under this endorsement ends when your operations for that insured are completed, which again leaves out completed operations, which your additional insureds are going to want. So the bottom line here is that if your contract requires somebody to be an additional insured, then they're supposed to automatically be an additional insured under the AI, AI endorsement. But as you can see, this one arguably only makes them an additional insured during construction period and not after the construction is completed. But most of these people are going to want to be additional insureds after construction is completed. Now, I'm guessing that, and I, in fact, I know in this particular case, if there was a certificate of insurance issued that showed the third parties as additional insureds, but never explained to them that they weren't additional insureds after the project was completed. So this, again, is, is a trap door uh, and, and another area that could lead to litigation over whether they're an additional insured or not. Courts frown on certificates of insurance that represent certain things on policies, but then the, the, the carrier says, oh, well, no, it doesn't really apply. So you want to be careful about that, um, and again, you want a broker who understands how this all operates. All right, now here's another additional insured endorsement that I pulled out of another policy, and it has a couple of interesting twists. So this is not in every blanket additional insured endorsement. This particular one says that the insurance afforded by this coverage part for the additional insured required by a written contract or agreement with the named insured is primary insurance and we will not seek contribution from any other insurance available to that additional insured. So that's saying this will be primary coverage. Now, most of your insurance provisions, if they are drafted by somebody who knows what they're doing, meaning a, a crafty general contractor or owner, are going to require that they be additional insured and that it be primary insurance. So this usually falls into line with what they want. But this means what it says. It means you're going to be providing the primary insurance for whoever signs on to this. So you want to be careful that you know you're doing that, that you know you're okay with it. And again, it's another, you want to negotiate pretty hard on allowing somebody to be an additional insured on your policy, if you can. Now the second part starts to back into another topic we're going to cover. It says we, we waive any rights to recover recovery we may have against any person or organization because of payments we make for injury or damage resulting from your ongoing operations or work done under a contract. In other words, they're going to waive their subrogation rights. Uh, if, though, you agreed to such a waiver and the waiver is included as part of a written contract or lease. So this says that if you've agreed to a waiver of subrogation, which we're going to talk about in a minute, then that applies and this carrier is waiving their rights to recovery. Uh, I, I don't like having these provisions in there on your behalf, but again, this gets down to the, uh, the carrier who's proposing terms and the policy form for that carrier and making sure your broker is aware of it and advises you, you know, that there are differences between, there may be differences in price, but there's also differences in coverage and differences in the two additional insured endorsements between those carriers. So rule number five, don't just review your policy form. Also review your endorsements and particularly the AI endorsement along with your, your broker. All right, your duty is in event of a claim. So you've gotten sued or you've been notified of a claim. So what does that mean? A claim usually means uh, uh, some occurrence alleging a wrongful act. Uh, you must see to it Here's a, a provision out of one of the policies. You must see to it that we are notified as soon as practical of an occurrence or an offense which may result in a claim. Now, that's worded that way on purpose. Uh, a claim or an occurrence doesn't just mean I've been sued. It can mean an accident. Uh, it can mean a, a particularly nasty letter arguing that you screwed up your work. It can mean a, a, a collapse. It can mean a lot of different things. And the key is an offense which may result in a claim, something that went wrong that might result in a claim. I always advise my clients to then report those to the carrier immediately. 
Uh, my general rule, and, and it's because of this provision in the policy, uh, you are required to immediately send copies of any demands, notices, summons, or legal papers received in connection with the claim or suit. And no insured will accept at that insured's own cost, meaning not covered by the policy, voluntarily make a payment, assume any obligation, or incur any expense other than for first aid, immediate first aid, without our consent. So you want to be very, very careful about taking on any cost, any obligation, admitting any liability, uh, or doing anything without the carrier's consent, or you may be faced with having to pay for that yourself. So one of my rules is this, uh, tender early and tender often to your carrier and report claims to your bro broker for reporting to your carrier whenever they come up and work with your carrier uh, on, on those issues. Do not let your renewal date pass without reporting a known claim, especially if you're changing carriers. Now this, this is occurrence-based coverage, not claims-made coverage where it's more critical, but you still you don't want to be in a, put a, in a position where the carrier argues that you didn't report the claim in a timely manner. Now, you have to balance that out a little bit against having dozens and dozens of claims reported because that may actually impact your insurance rates, uh, particularly if those result in actual defense costs. So there is a bit of a balancing act, uh, but the safe harbor is to report incidences to your carrier, uh, even if they aren't going to result in anything, at least keeps them advised, and then you don't, you're not faced with uh, uh, any issues down the road. If you, if you have a zero deductible policy, which a lot of you probably do, it also means that they will appoint and pay for counsel who can advise you on the claim or the potential claim, and you'll get, you'll get legal advice to make sure you're doing the right thing. It's just a, it's a safe harbor. Uh, and while it may affect your rates if there's a lot of claims reported, uh, it puts you in the safe position. All right, now we're going to get to subrogation, and I, and I understand that this has been a hot topic. So what, what does subrogation mean? And what, what, what we always do is we go back to Webster's Dictionary, and it's, of course it's defined as the act of subrogating. Well, that's not helpful at all, but specifically, the assumption by a third party as a second creditor or an insurance company of another's legal right to collect a debt or damages, damages. And if we look at an actual legal dictionary definition of subrogation, we see this. Assuming the legal rights of a person for whom expenses or a debt has been paid, typically subrogation occurs when an insurance company, which pays its insured client for injuries and losses, then sues the party which the injured person contends caused the damages to him or her. So the way this would operate is that, let's say, there's a claim against you, and you uh, turn it over to your insurance carrier, and your insurance carrier decides to pay to resolve the claim or pay the damages or pay the injured party or pay for somebody's damaged property. But there are other contractors who participated in that injury. Your carrier can then be subrogated to your rights, and go after those other parties for contribution to that claim. Now, what usually happens is everybody gets sued together, and they're all in the same boat. But sometimes it works out that one carrier might pay the claim, but then go after the other parties. That's uh, the way it works. That's to your benefit, because it reduces the claim ultimately. It reduces the cost to the carrier, and they get a recovery. Some carriers don't like to do that, because it's called paying and chasing to recover uh, but it's a right you have, and, and it's a valuable right. What, what happens, though, is that, uh, is that parties who are negotiating contracts with you will do a number of things, including you asking you to waive that subrogation right. Now, to understand the waiver of subrogation, we need to first understand where it originally came from. It originally came from these standard contracts like the A201 General Conditions, American Institute of Architects General Conditions. That has an Article 11 that covers four different areas. It covers contractor's liability insurance, owner's liability insurance, property insurance or builder's risk, or, and payment and performance bonds. Now, of, of critical importance here 
is that even under those original contracts, only 11.3, in other words, only the property insurance provision under 11.3 contained a waiver of subrogation. Now, why would that be? Well, keep in mind, that's for builder's risk. That's for damage to property during construction by fire, theft, vandalism, collapse, earthquake, flood, false work, I just noticed as I was looking at it this time, testing and startup temporary buildings, debris removal, uh, occasioned by, or other things occasioned by legal requirements. You think about that a minute, if there's a fire, if there's theft, if there's an earthquake, if there's a hurricane, if there's a, a tornado that hits the building, you got one carrier that pays the property damage, that's all been negotiated by the parties, they agree up front between the owner and the general contractor who's going to provide the builder's risk coverage, and that it should all be done, and, and nobody's going to have any rights to go after the hurricane or the tornado anyway, so a waiver of subrogation makes perfect sense there. And generally that didn't apply to you guys as subcontractors, if you're concrete subcontractors, because this is all typically worked out between the owner and the general contractor, and one or the other of them buys the builder's risk coverage. So, but what we see uh, so many times um, is that the, the parties then decide that, well, if waiver of subrogation works here, I should get waiver of subrogation everywhere for all different coverages. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from some of you what you're seeing uh, in, in waiver of subrogation requests. So the important thing to remember here is that the GL policy uh, there's no there's no waiver of subrogation requirement in the standard AIA general conditions, so it has to get it has to get added. Other than the builder's risk, it has to get added either in the 0800 supplementary general conditions, or the owner contractor agreement, or subcontractor agreements. And what's happening here is that the owners and the general contractors are attempting to shift the burden of all liability to you guys by indemnification. Uh, and this new defense obligation I talked about, uh, and then requiring that they be additional insureds on your policies and requiring a waiver of subrogation. So then they've got you tied up three different ways. They've got you indemnifying them for anything that happens, although uh, that should also be limited to your liability and to, or to the extent of your liability, but they try to get broader than that. And then they ask that they be an additional insured on your E&O policy, or a GL policy, so they can make a direct claim against the policy. And then they require that policy to waive subrogation so nobody can pay a claim and come after them. And, then they've, and now they've shifted the burden to you to the point that you essentially become the owner on the general contractor's insurance carrier. And I realize that you're in a, a tough bargaining position. Uh, I picture it... Um, something like this slide, uh, and I know that's where you're at, and particularly that's where you've been in this bad economy where you're trying to get work just to keep the boat floating. Uh, but as the economy gets better, I hope we have an opportunity to push back on some of these onerous indemnification, defense, uh, additional insured and subrogation issues. Rule number eight, to the extent you can negotiate the indemnification and subrogation clauses, uh, uh, I had one that crossed my desk yesterday from a major general contractor here in the Twin Cities, and it was presented as a no-change contract by the general contractor, and we were able to work back through and get certain of the defense portions deleted. We were able to limit the, the coverage to damage to property uh, other than the work itself, which brings it within the GL coverage. The trick with indemnification is you want to make sure that it's at least negotiated back to the point that it stays within your GL coverage. Uh, and, and that is something you need your attorney for and your broker for. All right, now there are some changes coming that are of interest. The 2013 changes to ISO forms that have just been issued this past summer. Uh, you need to be aware of these or your broker needs to be aware of these. And the interesting ones uh, are consistent with one issue. Here's the Additional insured endorsement is going to change, and what's going to change at the very bottom is that the insurance afforded to such additional insured only applies to the extent permitted by law. Now, why would they put that in? They put that in 
because a lot of states are passing uh, anti-indemnification and insurance statutes that cover how these things work. Uh, there's another one here, uh, additional insured provision. If, if coverage provided to the additional insured is required by a contract or agreement, the most we will pay on behalf of the additional insured is the amount of insurance required by the contract or agreement or available under applicable limits of insurance shown in the declarations, whichever is less. This raises another potential issue. I, I've always suggested, and I've gotten into major arguments with coverage attorneys, but I've always suggested that what an additional insured gets under your policy could be limited by the contract. It could be limited, the amount of coverage could be limited, uh, what it covers could be limited, and this all of a sudden has an additional insured endorsement now that says it's limited to the amount of insurance required by the contractor agreement, which at least would limit the amount. It might even limit the coverage or terms. So uh, I am uh, going to be looking at, uh, as one stopgap measure, seeing if we can limit coverage under the additional insured endorsement in the contract for the work as a way to mitigate some of this additional insured issue. Uh, here's another one um, at the bottom. The point, the sentence I want to point to is at the very bottom. Tort liability means a liability that would be imposed by law in the absence of any contract or agreement. Um, I'm sorry, it's the next sentence up. However, such part of a contract or agreement should only be considered an, an insured contract to the extent your assumption of tort liability is permitted by law. Again, that's to address these various state statutes that are coming into play. Now, one of them in our backyard in Minnesota, as of this last summer, last legislative session, now reads that a provision that requires a party to provide insurance coverage to one or more parties, including third parties, for the negligence or intentional acts or omissions of any of those parties, including third parties, is against public policy and is void and unenforceable under Minnesota law. Now, there's a group of attorneys here who believe that that can't possibly apply to additional insured status. There's another group of us who think this does apply to additional insured status, which brings into question whether you can be an additional insured on a policy of a contractor now in Minnesota. And that is why I think ISO is changing their forms to reflect the fact that some states are starting to frown on uh, the general contractor being an additional insured on everybody's policy uh, and never having to pay a claim under their own policy. That's an issue that's going to have to be sorted out. Uh, there are, there's no case law on it yet. This is brand new uh, statutes uh, that are in play. And this is also, by the way, why we're starting to see the defense clauses come out. Uh, and all the general contractors now have rewritten their contracts in Minnesota to have an independent defense obligation, which they're going to say is not insurance and it's not uh, indemnification. So it's not void under the indemnification statute. It is instead an independent defense obligation. Keep an eye out for that. You want to strike it from your contracts if you possibly can. All right. Rule number nine, be aware of the indemnification insurance statutes in the states that you work. I'm sure you're going to be delighted to know that every one of these states in the union, all 50 of them, have their own separate statutes that cover this, and they're all different. So if you're working in multiple states, You've got to be aware of multiple indemnification and other issues. Uh, you're certainly aware of multiple states' contractor licensing issues and so on, so it shouldn't be a total shock to everybody. But it is uh, a bit difficult when you uh, figure out how to negotiate your contract and how the rules apply in one state, and then you go across the border and all those rules change. And rule number 10, meet regularly with your broker to understand the changes to your GL policy forms. And I think, if I remember right, that is about the end of the formal part of the presentation I wanted to make. That leaves us 10 minutes for uh, questions and answers. And I think I need to bring Richard back online to do that. Thank you. Once again, we will begin the audio question and answer session. If you have a question, please press 0, then 1 on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press 0, then 2. If you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if there are any questions, please press 0, then 1, 
on your touchtone phone. Standing by for audio questions. Again, that's zero then one on your touchtone phone. We have a question online from BJ Forenson. Please go ahead. Yes, um, I was. You said to uh, to fight hard, um, fight hard with those to keep them off the to be enlisted as additional shirt on your policy. Yeah. Uh, there, there's very few contracts that we. I don't think there's any that that don't ask for that. Um, how can we go? How can we go about? I guess. So how can we go about not uh, fighting for that? I, I'm, and I, I I completely understand, and I'm aware of the fact that that it's become a pretty standard practice. Uh, uh, what I want to do is point out to you the various nuances in it and and how it operates, and uh, I I'm not sure that I have a silver bullet answer for you other than just say no. Uh, it's easier for specialty. It's easier for specialty subcontractors, uh, uh, to the extent that you're competing with other subs and there's others who could step in. Uh, it makes it much more difficult, and you feel like you're the the you get your head in the mouth of the lion. I understand that. So I'm I'm very sympathetic. I, I deal with it all the time. Uh, the, the cases that I've been the most successful on behalf of my clients have been, as I said, the specialty contractors where the, the general or the owner really wants that, specifically con that specific contractor either to do very specialized work or to do uh, marina installation or something like that that's, that's very, very critical. Um, so I, I completely understand your question, and it's very, very fair, and it's a good observation. Also, did you say to watch out for the defense language? Yes. You're going to start seeing a separate, it'll probably be part of the indemnification clause, but it'll be a separate paragraph that says, as an independent duty, you agree to defend me from any lawsuits that arise out of your work from day one. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll start to see that, and you want to try to strike that as well. You want to get back to indemnify and hold harmless only if you can and and that that gives the other party the protection they need because that always covers attorney's fees as well the right. difference is under that clause you'll be paying attorney's fees later under the defense clause you got to pick up the defense from day one okay all right well th yeah thank you we have a very we have a very what i feel is very good uh, insurance agent broker that is that fights for us constantly on, on indemnification language and contracts, and we've we've fought a couple general contractors in the area, and and they've said that well nobody else has brought this up, and so a lot of people are just going along with it, a lot of stuff. Yep. No, I got I got that just yesterday when I dealt with a major contractor here, and I'm 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 always amused by that because first of all I'm not entirely sure it's really true, but secondly, I'm I'm always concerned by the number of Contractors who seem to just put a blindfold on and sign these agreements, and right. you may you may go you may go quite a while uh, without a problem, but but when you end up having to defend somebody from day one in a case that you had very little to do with, it becomes an ugly surprise. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you. Our next question comes from Greg Hyde. Please go ahead. Greg, your line is open. If your line is muted, please unmute it. Sorry, I had it on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, thank you. I think you basically answered what was going to be my question. Uh, the previous caller had basically said um, about the additional insured. I had the same question about subrogation or waiver of subrogation. Um, but my question basically transformed. Do you see any legislation or anything coming down the pike that is going to help the subcontractor going forward, or is there any, you know, anything we can do to better our cause in the industry? Because, I mean, like the uh, previous caller had said, I mean, 
the waiver of subrogation now is becoming pretty standard, kind of the same way additional insurers are pretty standard. And I'm trying to fight it, but I'm not really making too much headway, and I am a specialty Re contractor. Really, really good question, and I'm glad you asked it because it prompts me to address something I should have said earlier. Yes, the language in Minnesota that was passed, the statutory language and the anti-indemnification statute in Minnesota, was the direct result of the subcontractors banding together and going to the legislature and getting that uh, change to the indemnification statute. And it was successful. Unfortunately, they didn't think of defend when they did it. But, but another interesting thing happened here, and I don't know if this is true in your part of the country or not, but the AGC really didn't do much to object to it, and I was scratching my head trying to figure out why they weren't screaming and yelling at the legislature. It turns out that in our AGC here in Minnesota, a lot of contractors also function as subcontractors occasionally, and they basically lashed the contractors to their desks and told them to stay away from the legislature and didn't let them object. So the subcontractors were able to band together and get some legislation passed here that was uh, very helpful for them. We're just seeing the natural counterattack. It's like a chess game. You know, they got the anti-indemnification legislation passed and the, uh, the provision that you can't require somebody else to buy insurance for you, but now they're counteracting that with the defense clauses. So, yes, there are things you can do, and you can work with whatever organizations you have to try to get legislation passed that, that limits this ability. And you could look at Minnesota's statute to, uh, uh, as an example of that. Okay. Thank you. Just add defend to it when you, go, when you do it in your state. Yes. Our next question online comes from Rich Raffin. Please go ahead. Yes, when you talked about changes to the ISO form, you – and I might have this wrong, but you talked about limits to the uh, additional insured uh, coverage that they would um, – actually, say additional insured coverage would be limited to the amounts of the insurance listed in the contract. Is that – am I saying that correctly? Uh, this, I, have, I have the uh, slide on the screen now, which is the, the new ISO additional insured endorsement language. Uh, and it says, as coverage is provided, uh, the most we will pay on behalf of the additional insured is the amount of insurance required by the contract or agreement. So, so right now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So right now, if I have a certain, I have my coverage and I have my, um, you know, my limits on my coverage, and I have my additional insured people I'm in additionally insuring. Um, my limits, if they obviously have to be within the contract, can I, can that, can I, things go above that? Are, at this point, are we in a... No, they have, they would have access to your policy. Absent this language, they would have, uh, or any other language in your contract that I believe would be applicable, they would have full access to your full insurance policy limits. Ah, uh, okay, now, if those gotcha. Limits, yeah. Now, with the indemnification clause, you could be required to indemnify them or you could be required to defend them beyond your policy limits. And that's where you got to be careful. So even with indemnification, I like to limit the indemnification uh, to the applicable, the policy limits that are applicable or available to you. So yeah, you're because not betting the farm. You're right. I guess that you think that you're covered because you have the insurance. You're indemnifying them, but you're saying, okay, I, I, it's insured. But in this case, you're saying you it could be go above what your your limits of insurance are. In that case, you would be you, you'd be dealing with things that you're not insured for. Okay, it's insured to the extent that you have insurance, which means the limits of your policy. And, yeah, this and unless you've limited. It Available, yeah. Now, this, this would allow you to limit it to what's available to the policy, but your contract has to say that. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. I didn't realize that. That's interesting. Although, although item, no, item number two says available under the applicable limits of insurance shown in the declarations, whichever is less. So this additional insured under this new ISO o form would only have the policy limits. Yes. What other, their policy true. limits were, that's what would be they'd be right. liable for. I'm confusing the issue for you now. That's always what they had. 
But I do want you to understand that in your indemnification clause, that could be broader than the insurance you have. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. And at this time, I'm showing no further audio questions. Could I, is there time for just one wrap-up point? Yes, or please we, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I just want to point out these new ISO uh, provisions are not in place yet. So they would have to be adopted by the carriers. They would then have to be approved by the commissioners of insurance in the state if that's required. And then they would show up in the policies. But it's something to keep an eye on and something to have your broker keep an eye on. Thank you. See, we have no further questions at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand by for your post-conference.